they're almost they're almost ready. Oh, okay. Welcome, welcome. <laughs> so glad to see everybody here today. I hope your lunch is yummy. <laughs> and uh, my name is Mela Bush, Cardosa Bush, and I am the lead organizer for the Greater Four Corners Action Coalition. And today, I'm here to speak to you about community organizing. And I'll just tell you a little, uh, I want to tell you a little story. Last July, we cut ribbons on four new train stations. And as you can see, there's a question up there. It's July 17, 2013. And um, if this is what brought me here today. It was a culmination of a lot of work and a continuation of a lot of work that we still continue to work on. So if you look in the background, I don't know if any of you recognize any of those folks that are standing behind me while I'm gesticulating. <laughs> but um, I'll identify a few of them. So we have here, we have, oh look, it's Governor Patrick. <laughs> and he's just smiling and there's Dr. Beverly Scott, does anyone know who Dr. Beverly Scott is? No? The, oh, who, who's Dr. Beverly Scott? Could you tell us who that is? The first African-American female general manager of the Massachusetts Bay Transit Authority, Dr. Beverly Scott, and uh, she's currently serving in that position. Also, we have, um, one of the first African-American female um, city councilors, Ayanna Presley. It's Women's History Month, so I might be talking a little bit about women's history. Um, we also have uh, Rich Davey, who's right behind me, and he is the, uh, the Secretary of Transportation for the Mass Department of Transportation. And I was at that podium speaking about something great that happened on July 17th. 2013, and I'll tell you what that is in a few moments. Um, we're here today to talk about community organizing. And does anybody know what community organizing is? Can we get like a, this is going to be an interactive thing, so if you uh, have chewed and don't think you'll choke, <laughs> I'm going to ask a question about what community organizing is, and I'm not going to let him answer because I think he knows unless nobody else jumps up. How about you up there? <laughs> we might have another community organizer here. Yeah, what is community organizing? Uh, community organizing is finding out what people want and finding collective ways of getting it. Hmm, that's a good answer. What about you? I think somebody up there also raised their hand. I didn't raise my hand, but I'll, I'll answer. Oh, okay. He's not a plant. <laughs> so that is a good definition of community organizing. And it's pulling people to fight against systemic racism and all the other isms and schisms that uh, actually uh, plague our society today. Um, does anybody other than me, could we name a couple of other community organizers that you might know of? Barack Obama, very good. He organized himself right into the Oval Office. Uh, <laughs> um, how about another one? Mother Teresa. Very good. Just Cesar Chavez. Who saw the movie? <coughs> when, uh, I, I saw it as soon as it came out yesterday. I, I couldn't resist that. So, um, so Cesar Chavez. So the United Farm Workers, Cesar Chavez, worked uh, to, um, I don't know if anybody's old enough to remember the, uh, the, the boycott of the grapes 
and how they brought those uh, grape growers to their knees and they finally made deals to give better working conditions to workers. So what we've been working and organizing around, I'll tell you a little bit more about my background. Um, well, we'll get back to her. Children in asthma. I started out as a community organizer because I have, te I have 10 people in my family who have asthma. And this is an environmental justice conference. I was born and raised in Roxbury, and I still li I live in Roxbury now on the border of Dorchester. And about three blocks from my home, there are a bunch of uh, waste transfer stations, garbage dumps, right next to a huge housing development, a project, I don't know if we were the projects or it was a project, a development project. So, um, so we grew up, and I was a very tiny little child who was very small and had trouble gaining weight and had fevers all the time, and nobody knew why. And I believe that it was related to the toxic waste and trash that was brought in uh, by the truckload of garbage trucks and um, processed through a few uh, blocks from my house. I grew up, my three children have asthma, all three of them in various degrees of severity. And this is what motivated me to get involved in community organizing. In the 90s, I moved into a house and I brought my eight-year-old son there. And this, this young man, uh, we didn't know that the house had mold in it. We did know that sometimes we would see little black dots in the bathroom, but we thought it was just moisture and we would open the window. But it kept growing back and it ended up in my son's lungs. And my son um, ended up uh, with acute, severe, persistent, and chronic asthma that hospitalized him 33 times. So as a mom, fighting for my son's life and trying to keep him alive, one day I went to, um, I went to a town hall meeting and I was thrust into this um, environmental justice organizing and we started rallying the parents together, teaching them to advocate for themselves, to speak out for themselves, to mobilize, to try and get better health care. We were involved in that. We went into the schools and we taught the parents and the children about asthma and how to better deal with the asthma, from indoor air quality issues to um, the Clean Buses for Boston campaign. We got involved with that. So um, while I was a private citizen, just working to keep my child alive, I ended up losing my home. I lost my place of residence. We were rendered homeless for a year. We lost everything that we had, including a very good job at the phone company while I tried to take care of my child. I went from a middle class, close to six figure income, down to less than $10,000 a year, uh, trying the hem pants and the tailor shop that I opened on the side. It was my little side business. And it became my only source of income. So. When you get into adversity in that level, you can either, you know, have sour grapes, sour lemons. You could take those lemons, you could make some lemonade, or you could organize people to buy the whole lemon grove, and then we could all learn how to make lemonade for ourselves. So that's what we uh, got up and started doing. The, um, so um, about eight years ago, I got involved, I came back into the organizing field. I stepped out to take care of my son. Um, let me see, let me back up there for a second. So I started an organization called IMPACT, the Involved Massachusetts Parents of Asthmatic Children and Teens. And we, we got a core group of parents together and we reached out and we became kind of a member organization to um, teach parents how to better deal with their children's asthma. We taught them how to, um, to go up to the state house and fight for better medical rights for themselves. And we also taught them how to talk to their doctors. And that, that part of my organizing, and it was more advocacy than it was organizing because we were actually speaking out on behalf of other people. We worked with Boston Medical Center, Children's Hospital. We worked with all, a bunch of uh, medical um, groups and we developed a number of programs that helped people 
to reduce their asthma, um, suffering from asthma, and it also helped my child. We taught them about environmental toxins as well as nutritional issues that, um, and allergies that were causing their children to have asthma attacks. And this, this was good on that level, but we needed to go to take it to another level. So I went and I worked for the Greater Four Corners Asthma, I mean, Action Coalition. <laughs> it's not an asthma coalition. In, Do in Dorchester. And that's an area that I grew up in. And the Fairmount Line, anybody know what the Fairmount Line is? A few people have heard of the Fairmount Line? Okay, somebody want to tell me what the Fairmount Line is? What do you know about the Fairmount Line? Commuter rail? Train line? Okay. Somebody else? Okay, so Fairmount Line was in the commuter rail system. It's a 9.1 mile stretch of, uh, of track that runs through the environmental justice communities of Boston. Low income and communities of color concentrated in this area and we had train line going right through it. And guess what we used to get from that train line? Anybody have an idea? No service, asthma, diesel particulates, <laughs> you know, maybe a little cancer thrown in, you know, the, all the good stuff that everybody wants from a train line. But no service for the people who were living there. So back in the 80s, they took the um, orange line out of another section of lower income transit dependent community and moved it over to another section of Boston. And while they were doing that, taking away their, our transportation from Roxbury and things, um, they moved the, uh, they, they diverted the train service down through, um, through the Fairmont corridor. So they took the Amtrak trains, they were electrifying the train line, and they moved the service over there. And in the process, they just put more diesel particulates on the community. And when they were done building the orange line through the Southwest corridor, they said, okay, shut that down. We don't need that service anymore. And we got to sit there and watch this train line going through. So we needed to activate and mobilize ourselves. So the Greater Four Corners Action Coalition spearheaded the efforts to get this train line um, open, get some stations built, and we were able to um, pull together people, and it took a lot. So the way that we, we organized ourselves, we did focus groups, we did um, rallies, protests, we, we, um, we sat down, we did one-on-ones. Our, our organization actually works by building microcosms of many governments within the Four Corners catchment area, and those are neighborhood associations. And so we can go and tap into those residents and get the residents engaged to talk about these things, to come out and to come out to different things like development meetings and things like that, so that we don't end up getting gentrified out of our community. So as we mo mobilized and organized ourselves, we were able to do something that we call grass tops organizing and grassroots organizing. So grassroots organizing is getting people out, getting them involved, developing leaders to go and speak out on, their, on our behalf or on their own behalf as residents, and to also um, use different uh, mobilizing and activist type tactics like uh, coming and I'll show you a few, wait a second. We have a couple of things that happen here. Uh, Okay, there's one. <laughs> you could go out and dress up like a superhero. Now, you think that's funny. It looks silly, doesn't it? Somebody wouldn't take a picture of me when I put on that costume. But um, we went out, we dressed up like superheroes, and we had this group called the Fast Five. And this is in partnership with some of our other coalition partners. And the Fast Five were some solutions to uh, stopping a fare increase on the MBTA. And so we got up and we went out and we, we used something that looked silly but got a lot of attention. 
we were able to shut down the MBTA Finance Committee with that group, and they had to, they had to stop what they were doing, and they, they took notice, and they stood up and they said, well, these folks are down here. They're not going to give up. You know, some folks had to lay down in the road. We had, uh, what do you call it, die-ins where you lay out and you maybe paint uh, chalk lines around yourself and say, you know, this is what happens. You know, this is what the MBTA is going to look like if they don't fix their problems. So we've, we've come and we've done this type of organizing where you go in and you do things that get a lot of attention and garner a lot of media attention. We also, um, we work to, let's see, this isn't in the uh, order that I wanted to. Uh, so um, there's a question. <sighs> Sorry, there, we had some technical difficulties one a little, a little nervous. Um, we want to look at community organizing and how we can change the outcomes in the environmental justice ish fights that we are working on today. So the transportation issue of getting the trains running down the Fairmount line is really important. And we had to come up with some, through our, um, our grass tops organizing, to go up to the state level and to get them to listen to us. So you see how we did it at grassroots level, but on the state level, how do you organize uh, elected officials to actually listen to you and to do what you want them to do? Well, I'll tell you what we did. We went to the, um, we went to the, we organized a group of elected officials that were our, our city officials and our state elected officials. And we, we would go and meet with them and work really closely with them to develop a strategy to get the actual MBTA to do what we wanted them to do. But we also went and worked with the MBTA and told them that we are their allies and we're working with them, we're not working against them. And we brought them up to the state level and we got them all to start talking with one another. We put together um, advocacy, public policy change, working on um, bills. We weighed in on the current transportation bill, and we, um, we got them to um, put in some amendments for what the people wanted, okay? And so some of the things that we got into the transportation bill that is currently the way forward that the governor just passed was um, a, to change the type of trains that are running on the Fairmount line. Does anybody know what a diesel multiple unit is? You can tell them. <laughs> You're gonna find out. It's, uh, it's a train that uses a, um, uh, diesel, uh, uh, thicker than the normal train that's, that's used now. It's, um, uh, it's, I don't know if there's any that's actually running in, in the United States right now. So as we're organizing, we're, we're, we started thinking about what type of trains could we put on this line that were less polluting and, um, and, and how could we change it so that all we got out of that is not diesel particulates, asthma, and a side of cancer. So we, so we looked at a bunch of different things we could um, do, for example, the diesel multiple unit. And we've been, we've been asking the MBTA for a long time to uh, put these type, to change the type of train stock that runs down this Fairmount line, okay? So one of the things, this diesel multiple unit train, right now they're using locomotives that push and pull the train, 
and so there's a lot extra, more pollution that um, is being produced by these trains. They, they change the, the uh, fuel to ultra low sulfur diesel, but that's not really, um, that's not really a solution. So we're, we're moving in the direction of getting uh, less polluting trains on the line. Ultimately, we would love to see it become electrified as long as they weren't getting electricity from a coal-fired plant. Um, so <laughs> that would be great. So the DMU it has been included. The, the governor just included a, a diesel multiple unit pilot, and they're going to uh, try it out on the Fairmount line. And we've been asking them that for the past uh, at least 10 to 14 years. I'd say maybe around the year 2000, 2002, when the uh, feasibility study was done on this line. So we're making progress. Another thing that we're organizing around uh, to get better service and to get people out of their cars and onto th this uh, line and get the community to use the line is to get the fares. So we're working in concert and coalition with a number of coalitions, the On the Move Coalition, the Fairmont Coalition, the Green Justice Coalition, and we have to do a lot of collaborative efforts because there's strength and power in numbers. And that's another key issue it, uh, when you're working to get people around a campaign is to have a lot of mobilized people. And so we bring these coalitions together that represent different groups. So On the Move Coalition has bike, it has, um, it has um, with uh, like Livable Streets Alliance, uh, the Alternatives for Community and Environment. We have Bikes Not Bombs. We have uh, the Sierra Club. <laughs> and we have, uh, we have another group called Washington Corridor Coalition. I don't know, and the Greater Four Corners Action Coalition. And so we worked with these groups to, um, to develop events and to bring together people to get them to um, lower the fares on the line. So up until uh, July 1st of 2013, we were paying, we had three fares. The last stop on the line was, nine, uh, was uh, zone two, and the fare was $6 at Reedville. When you come to Fairmont, it was $5.50. And then all of the new stations got, got to pay $2 a regular subway fare. So people wouldn't want to get on the line like that. So we, we continue to organize and organize, and we won a number of victories last year. And so the first slide that you saw, um, where we are, so these are some of the ways that we are organizing. The, the first slide, we got to July 17th, 2013, and we cut the ribbon on the Four Corners Geneva Station. And that was over 20 plus years of working with community, community residents and working to get our stations built. And the, the community actually came out. The residents decided what they wanted to see in that station, how it would look, how it was constructed, what type of um, amenities were there. We got them to put bus shelters in there. We got, um, we got them to lower the fares, and we finally cut the ribbons. This was an amazing feat uh, in the city of Boston to actually get them to build new stations and to open those things. And so that was the ribbon cutting. So we finally made it to that day, and we cut three ribbons that day for all of the three new stations. So that was the first ribbon cutting. Then we went over to Talbot Ave Station, which is another station that was built uh, that the mayor actually put into the mix to get that station built. And then we went and cut the ribbon over there, and then we went and cut the ribbon on the New Market Station, uh, which is next to one of the biggest functioning malls, uh, well, the, in the city of Boston. Uh, with, the, with so many jobs and so much going on in that area, and we cut that ribbon that day too. So um, that's like so amazing. Now, what happens after the ribbons are cut? Guess what? Some people call these train stations an amenity. 
as if we didn't need some good train service and a way to get from point A to point B and to access the, the amazing jobs that are available, the 15,000 jobs around in the new market area and foreclosure crisis. We run into, we saw um, like so many homes in Greater Four Corners area around Dorchester, Roxbury, and Mattapan have been foreclosed upon. So Greater Four Corners works on not just transportation uh, organizing for transportation justice. Another EJ issue is this issue of gentrification. So we are currently, after the ribbons were cut, we're like, well, and before that, we said, wow, we're trying to stabilize, stabilize this, um, this bleed out of homes and people being caught up in what I call the centrifugal force you know, of the merry-go-round of gentrification, and you're trying to hang on, and this is swirling around you, and all of a sudden you're just blown out of the community, and you end up in Fall River. You end up in another, uh, another community outside, you know, New Bedford, Lawrence, Lowell. They're actually driving people out of the city and saying, well, you should live here now. And what do we do? We transfer the issues that we have organized from one community to another, to another, and then we look around and the Fairmount line is not being utilized by the EJ community, it's being utilized by somebody else that thought, wow, it's really a nice place to live there. You look, they fix the schools, they change them all to charter schools, you know, and now it's a good place. You have education, good transportation. If you build it, they will come. You know, we, we, we build some new nice, homes there, some affordable housing, and then the people are gone who made that community, who have been living there for 50, 60, 70, 100 years. I live in a house with a woman who's been living in this house for 50 years, right on the, the edge of the Four Corners catchment area. She doesn't want to move, but if all, the, all the, the home prices go skyrocketing into the stratosphere, then we end up with the stress of displacement, the stress of having to go away from your, um, the community that you wanted to continue to live in, your support networks, your, your health care, your everything. So what's next? We're working on regional equity right now because equity is the key issue here, equitable development, equitable um, transportation distribution, equitable education. Not just equality, but equity. Equity minus the, uh, the um, institutional racist structures that, are, that do not care about people and push them right out of our communities. So we're, trying to, we're working to stabilize the rents. We're working on pilots now to, um, to buy back, to get friendly investors to buy back some of these homes that may have been foreclosed upon and put people back in. Last week we just, um, we just celebrated the ribbon cutting on one of the first homes that we did in the Four Corners catchment area um, where a friendly investor bought back the foreclosed property, fixed it up, and sold it back at a reasonable price to a local resident so that they don't have to get pushed out of their homes. So we have to continue our fight. You can't just go and cut ribbons on really nice train stations and then it stops right there. We have to keep organizing. We have to be organized, and we need the help of, of everyone who is involved in environmental justice issues. We're working with the EPA right now and putting together an EJ consortium to address some of the issues and bring academia into it. We're standing here in Harvard Law School today, and we need more academics to come in to bring the, the, um, bring the information, to do the studies, to get the students to go out and, and work on these types of things. And we need more people to get involved on every level so that we can stay in our communities. And I say, well, you know, if, if, we, if we're having conversations with groups like Action for Regional Equity, the On the Move Coalition, um, which we are a member of, we're doing a project now uh, to stop what we call transit-oriented displacement. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> so I'm going to um, actually, 
Um, here's, here's a couple of more actions, maybe. <laughs> That's my daughter. <laughs> we were celebrating President Obama, one of the organizers that you described, on his inauguration day. The, those are some of the um, actions that we did with the T Riders Union going out and um, protesting in front of the uh, transportation building. We have, um, and of course, we want to remember her. This is the last, I'm going to close on this. This is the person who uh, really inspired me is Rosa Parks. Rosa Parks, anybody know who Rosa Parks is? <laughs> There she is with a mugshot, <laughs> mugshot of Rosa Parks. Because we're at the end of Women's History Month, and, and we just want to recognize some of our heroes and heroines. So on December 1st, 1955, she changed the course of history. And it all started on a bus. And they boycotted, and they won. And they got what they wanted in, in a movement for transportation justice. And someone sat down before her, it was a young lady. Um, but she didn't just get up and start organizing that day when she sat down on that bus. She had been sitting in meetings and learning and, and with her husband. And there was a whole background of organizing that happened to get her to that day to sit down on that bus. And that's the things that maybe people who have never been involved in community organizing don't understand. But there's a lot that goes on behind the scenes. There's a lot of leadership development. There's a lot of training. There's a lot of motivating people to stand up and to, to develop their voice so that they won't be afraid. You know, I recommend people go watch Cesar Chavez. The movie was so inspirational and so amazing. But he was sitting over in an office and he said, I have to, he said, I can't sit here. I need to go get my hands dirty. And sometimes we have to get in the trenches. We have to go into the homes. We have to go into the courthouses with people and fight for their rights to keep them in their homes. So this is my inspiration, was Rosa Parks. And it all started on a bus. And I'll say that a lot of the organizing around Four Corners, Act, Four Corners in the Four Corners Geneva Station that opened last July 17th started on a bus. It started on a 23 bus. We were riding for an hour and a half, an hour and a quarter to get downtown. And there's a train that now gets me to South Station in approximately 10 minutes. And we had, to, we had to be crushed into those uncomfortable, hot, steamy buses in the summer and rumble through and then take a train and take the shoreline that I call Red Line all the way to downtown. And we don't have to do that anymore. And we want to continue to stay there and to continue to be able to ride that train and to enjoy what we really fought for. And so we need all of you all to just pay attention and get involved. If we ask you to sign a petition or whatever it is, and we send it out to you, let's, let's uh, work together. I'd like to open it up to any questions that you might have right now. Any questions? Yes. So you start out with an idea and it's just you. How do you find like minds? Did you go out into the community to start talking? Did you put up flyers? Because you push and hold the button on the, in front of you, and you, and you into the loudspeaker. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Didn't know that. Um, nice. Uh, you that yes, please, so everyone can hear. <laughs> So um, I had 10 people in my family who had asthma. Okay. We kind of started with them. <laughs> we had a group. It was an instant group. <laughs> so you, um, that's one way. God forbid you have to have 10 people with asthma in your family, but um, an, an extended family too. Um, let's see. So we, you start, you can work from, well now we have all kinds of ways to do it. Facebook, social media outlets, tweeting, you know, little mini Vine things that pop up on your screen. I don't know what that is. Six second videos. Someone sees it. Oh crap, we should go do that, you know. Um, 
So uh, when we didn't have social media, um, we started out with uh, really looking at what is this problem? Is there anybody else around me who's experiencing the same thing? Um, we, like the way we do it, we, we flyer, we, we organize um, meetings in the community, community meetings. We work with neighborhood associations. We help start uh, about six or seven of those neighborhood associations. And we got the people in the room and we got them to listen. You have little uh, breakfast, you go in your church. A lot of organizing started, uh, happened through churches, you know. So there's an issue that's going on. Everybody knows that that issue is there. You see the train riding by and there's, you're just watching it blow past, you know. We used to play on the tracks. We knew there was one freight train that was going to rumble through there once a week. We're not going to get hit by it because we're not going to be there. You know, oh, it comes this Sunday around 3 o'clock. Okay, <laughs> let's go play on the tracks. We could take the shortcut to our friend's house, you know. So that's, that's the first thing, is to um, identify the problem. And if, if, you're the, if, if you're the person who's starting, give me a, some issue that you might think is something that you might want to organize around. No? Well, I'll remember back when my children were small. I have three adult children. And there was a bus strike in 1987. My, my son was uh, about six weeks old. And I had three children. One went to school in East Boston, one went to school in Jamaica Plain, and one was a newborn baby who didn't like riding in cars. So I had to drive those children from Jamaica Plain, from uh, Dorchester to Jamaica Plain, East Boston, and back with a screaming baby in a car seat. I'm like, wait a minute, they need to negotiate this school bus strike. So I went, you know, I went and got some of the parents, and I'm like, we can't sit here and just like take this sitting down. We need to go and tell the school committee to negotiate with those bus drivers. And at that time, we went down, we started like, Negotiate. We're screaming outside the school committee headquarters, and, and we're telling them to negotiate. And you know, we brought our school parent council parents. That's where we got our first group of parents together. And then um, we went down and we started telling them to negotiate with the bus drivers. And then the, the news media saw me out there, and they said, "Wow, what are you doing? How are you getting all these babies to school and everything?" And, and dragging your baby all over the place. Can we ride in the car with you and follow you? I said, well, you're not gonna hear much. I don't think we'll have a conversation because <laughs> it's gonna sound like, oh yeah, we're driving down the Southeast Expressway. Wah, 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 wah. You know, and so that's what happened. <laughs> and um, so we, we got, and then we got, the, uh, we got the people together like that. I also, when I worked for the phone company, we had a, a, a phone strike. You know, we ended up doing a phone strike, so we got into union organizing. But that was our pool of, pool of people. So, I mean, that's one thing. There's, there's an issue that's in your face, and you organize a campaign around that, and you, um, you know, it takes uh, phone banking, calling people, calling your elected officials, calling the residents, getting lists, going out and knocking on doors. You know, you're gonna go up and get in their face and say, look, um, did you know, here's one, we're working on stopping foreclosures. We went and got lists uh, from, the, um, from the city of all the homes that were being foreclosed on. And we took that list and we went out and we knocked on doors. And it was a cold gray day and I remember knocking on these doors and, and it's really hard because it'll bring tears to your eyes. We knocked on the door of one person, they were moving a, a mattress into the house. I said, are you moving in here? She said, yes. Did you know this house is being foreclosed on? Oh, well, I don't own the house. They didn't even understand what a foreclosure was. I said, well, if the bank repos the house, you know what a repo man is? How about that? This the bank is now the official repo man, you know? So the repo guy comes and takes your car. Your car's gone, right? Oh, repo the house. OK, foreclosure, repo. Oh, my god. Oh, so I won't have a place to live. No. If the owner doesn't own the house, then you may not be living here anymore. So then the person let us in. Well, what can I do? 
oh, so we do workshops and educational workshops to teach people about the problem, about their rights, about how to stay put, about how not to get kicked out in the street. And we worked, uh, when we have a couple of other coalitions on housing and tenants' rights, uh, the Mass Alliance Against Predatory Lending and the uh, Coalition of Occupied Homes and Foreclosure, and we work with City Life Vida Urbana um, in, in coalition. And, and we got these, and there's bank tenant associations that were started things like that, to um, get people to stay in their homes. We work to keep people in their homes. We've uh, saved the number of homes from foreclosure. We found out about a lot of shocks and evil people who were just doing things and like literally stealing homes from people, telling them that they uh, owned it, that they had bought it at auction. And we went to the land records and they didn't own it. And we told the people, go home, change your locks back, you know, we had one family that slept in a car for uh, three months with their babies. Thank God it was summertime because someone lied to them, told them that their home was uh, not their home anymore and that they, that they owned it and they didn't own it. And the, the original owner still owned the house. And we put them back in the house. Uh, we, used, um, we used some of Harvard Legal Aid Bureau helps out um, with some of these issues and Greater Boston Legal Services and things like that. And so, you know, you identify the issue, you get people um, um, to come in and you develop leaders and then you have to mobilize and you do some advocacy and some policy change. That's basically, yes. Hi, Mella. Um, Hi. I did not hear what Marvin said about multiple diesel. So my question, I have a question that I have to ask You know, yesterday we were all conjuring Luke Cole and talking about using the line lawyers on tap, not on top. Can you talk a little bit about how, as a community organizer, you work with either uh, technical people or whether, you know, you get, like, bone up on whatever it is that you need to know about, and how you work with lawyers? So, what was the thing you said about Luke Cole? So the, uh, the, lawyer, the lawyer thing is, first I'll, I'll tell you a little more about the diesel multiple unit. Diesel, diesel multiple unit is a, 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 a self-contained locomotive train that can stop and start really fast, that can get a line like the Fairmount line to be more of a rapid transit service, which is what we asked for. We gave it a name, the Indigo line, okay? And so we, we we added more stations, so it's not functioning like um, it's not functioning as a uh, commuter rail service. We've even asked the T to not call it a commuter rail line; just call it a train line because it's more of an a, a, a urban kind of hybrid train line that has more stops, and, and it's not taking anyone to the suburbs, which is the definition of the commuter rail. So this train will be able to uh, stop and start. It has a center door. Um, so that if there's a curve on the platform where there's a curve, if the door's in the center, the door will line up with the platform so you don't have this gap, which is a problem for uh, people with strollers, handicapped people, people, blind people, whoever, you know, uh, the, the, the less abled or disabled community. So we want to make sure that that was something. So we've been really fighting and working hard to get that type of service on the, uh, on the line. And the lawyers on tap part. So how we work with lawyers is we, I'll give you an example, um, Bank Tenant Association. We bring the lawyers in and we bring, um, we'll bring a residents who might be in foreclosure. And the, the lawyer will be there as a resource and they'll come and volunteer their time and we'll pair people up so that they can come in and talk to the lawyers and then the, um, the lawyers 
can come and represent them in court if need be. And we'll use things, uh, other services around the city, whatever resources we can find, like maybe a fair housing center or, or that sort of thing. So I don't know if that quite answered the question. Um, is there a lawyer in here who's done some of this work who might want to uh, speak to that? Yes. Uh, the biggest challenge, sleep. <laughs> uh, that's true, I'm not going to lie. Uh, being a community or organizer is very draining emotionally sometimes. And, and, and not taking the, the issue on so much that you can't sleep anymore and you, you go to bed and you're, those things are swimming around in your head. That's why I said sleep. But another challenge is getting people to be courageous enough and brave enough to stand up for whatever issue it is that is affecting them. Now, as it relates to uh, foreclosure and, and um, uh, housing rights, a lot of people are embarrassed uh, so when we're pulling them out and trying to get them to be a, an advocate or a leader or, or speak out or get involved in a campaign on some level, they're nervous, they're embarrassed, they're like, oh, I'm a failure, I tried to give my, provide a home for my family, and I failed. So they don't want anybody to know. So the shame uh, is, factor is a, a big, huge thing to get people to uh, um, come out and share their issue, to, to speak truth to power, to be able to go in front of a news camera, or, um, or to say something that somebody does not want to hear. Even if it's, if it's the right thing to say, somebody might not want to hear it. Yesterday that happened, you know, with the, maybe I shouldn't bring it up, but, you know, with uh, Sheila uh, talking about the EPA not being there. So there's a learning opportunity for the EPA, who's in the room, who's working on issues of environmental justice on this 20th anniversary of our environmental justice ordinance, executive order. So we, we, we need to be able to say that thing that may not be able, not, people may not want to hear. And it takes a lot of courage. It takes a lot of courage to say that thing. And, you know, it's, and sometimes, I'll, sometimes it's, you know, the pen's mightier than the sword. Uh, sword. Uh, an example, I wrote a letter about, we had to send a letter from our organization to the MBTA to ask them for some detail on train station. And when we sent the letter some, to the general manager and the secretary, somebody else answered the letter. And they didn't give us what we wanted. And so this was the response. Oh send a letter back to the general manager and the secretary of transportation. I got a letter from one of your staff, but I sent you a letter. Am I to assume that that was you speaking through them because I did not see your name anywhere on that letter or CC? So I'm gonna ask you again, because I don't think you heard me the first time. We need you to do this this way. And then they said, oh, we should answer her. Because what can happen is you can CC the globe, you can CC everybody, you know, the governor, you know, who appoints some of these people, and okay, you're not doing your job. And so if you're, the courage, it's the courage to stand up and to make some noise on whatever level it is that you have to make that noise and get some sleep. <laughs> oh, there's, oh, one last question. Hi, James. There's a dimension to the environmental justice uh, aspect of, of transportation, which you didn't mention, which I think is quite interesting, and it's kind of consistent with some of the slides put up yesterday by Dr. Buller. Uh, um, if you look at a map, for example, of Chicago, you see the predominantly white suburbs driving, generating almost all of the pollution, most of the pollution, and the, you know, the urban concentration population relying on public transportation, not having anything like the carbon footprint of the people living in the suburbs who are driving their cars. So, you know, there's really interesting dimensions to this.
this whole issue. Um, when you said transit-oriented displacement, I just love that phrase. I had come up with a version which is um, TOD without the T. Mm. Because the flip side of it is we don't have adequate public transportation in, uh, in Boston. So I would ask you to talk a little bit more, expand on how you're building the campaign around displacement and affordable housing as it relates to transportation. OK. You, you ask a couple of questions. Right. So um, there. Uh, so the, the the question about the environmental justice, and um, I'm trying to keep. It, oh, okay. Uh, and the carbon footprint of the communities and the, the the folk that are not creating the problem. And there was a study done in 2004, and it was a, a it was published um, that that the the majority of the lower income and uh, people of color are not creating this issue that's causing climate change. It's just not a reality. If we're transit dependent and we're, you put 250 people on a, on a train and you put one person in the car, who's creating more of the problem? There's the question. Um, so, I mean, just do the math. 250 people are on the train, one train, 250 people as opposed to 250 cars on the, on the, uh, on the road. Um, the, other, the other question, oops. Was about how to build a campaign to, uh, against displacement as a consequence of climate change. Right. Because that's the issue that we have. Okay. So what we're doing right now, uh, we're working with a number of groups that work on regional equity. How do you build a campaign? We get the people who are working on housing, that are working on, uh, for example, um, Main Street groups, that are working on business development, that are working on community development. And we bring those groups together with the, um, the transportation justice groups, with the, um, uh, the regional equity uh, conversation that we're convening right now, is to go in and to set up uh, community uh, benefits agreements when developers come in, for example. First thing we had to do was educate the community about what development is, how it works, and how much of a voice they have in what comes into the community. In Four Corners, we, rather than letting the Department of Neighborhood Development and the BRA w run our uh, community process for our comprehensive planning, we have done more than one iteration of a comprehensive plan and developed a master plan for the community and then filed it downtown before they came out and said, hey, look at all that nice land near that train station. Why don't we just take that over and you know, do whatever we want, put a si skyscraper, you know, give some like 10 year tax break to the developers so they don't even have to pay taxes like they did in New York. We're also, um, we're doing a campaign with house parties and going into people's homes and screening a film that we found uh, called My Brooklyn that talks about how they gentrify Brooklyn and then get people to get involved by having that conversation. You can use anything, it can be a pan pancake breakfast, a movie screen, going into someone's home, sitting down one on one. But we're bringing the groups into the room who are actually working on all of these different issues. And then we're mobilizing through that kind of network and having these conversations and then working to put a plan in place that will uh, create the change that we want. Thank you. And it's, <laughs> thank you. Thank you.